Often when you hear people talk about how to program, you'll hear them use the word control flow. You might hear someone ask about what is the program's control flow at this point. Now control flow refers to the aspect of a programming language that decides which statements to execute in which order and how those statements are organized into logical structure as the program executes. A good example of control flow is something like an if form. The if form evaluates its guard and then based on the guard decides whether to take the true branch or the false branch. Now you're probably fairly familiar with tons of control constructs already. So for example, you use things like if and cond and match, things like that. All of those decide which statement or which path in the code to take based on various tests that happen. Now traditional languages like C and C++ often structure their code into what are called blocks of sequential statements that all execute one after another. But instead, functional programming languages drive the execution much more using function application. So let's look at this example right here. We've got lambda x x applied to lambda y y applied to 5. So to evaluate this entire form right here, to evaluate this entire call site, this entire application, what I've first got to do is, well, I want to apply this function to this argument. But remember, Racket makes a choice. We call Racket a call by value language. So what that means is that Racket's going to first evaluate this, uh, this argument right here. It's going to try to work on this. And so control is going to flow to evaluating this expression right here. That's the first thing that happens in the program. Now that we're evaluating this expression, what's going to happen? Well, we'd like to perform in this application right here. However, we first need to check that we have values as our arguments, right? Because we can only apply a function once we have arguments reduced to the values. All right, but we see here, we see this value five as our argument and we can apply this lambda. And so we're going to reduce this. This returns to five and then control returns back to then evaluating and performing this application. So now we want to perform this entire application right here. And then control is going to flow to x, but where x has been replaced by 5. All right, so we can see in this simple example how control flows and starts when we start evaluating this call site. The first thing that we have to do is evaluate the function. Well, there's already a function right here. That's a value. Then we start have to evaluate the arguments down to values. So we've got an application right here. It's not a value quite yet, so we need to reduce it. And so now control is going to sort of flow to then evaluating these two things. All right, let's look at some more examples. So I've got this example here where we're computing the factorial in Racket. We have a base case and an inductive or recursive case. And let's see how control transfers through the program as we execute it. So we can think of recursion as substitution using our textual reduction model. So if we say factorial of two, we can sort of unfold the definition of factorial, we drop it in, and we just get if equals two zero one, otherwise times two factorial sub one two. All right, so this is just our typical definition of our substitution based or our textual reduction semantics that we've already seen so far in class. All right, so we can keep sort of doing that and, and what we see is that we can continue down here. Each subsequent call to factorial we can sort of think of as a transfer of control, right? We can sort of think about when our code is executing, we're first executing in this call right here to factorial, but when we call factorial again, we're unfolding it. And so now we're going to focus and start making progress on this new call right here. We finally reduce down, we hit our base case and we bottom out. We result in return the value one. But then we have to remember that we have to go back up and do all of this work that we left ourselves to do. So when we initially called factorial on uh, factorial on one, well, we were remembering we had to go back 
and eventually perform that multiplication to get our final result. The result of the factorial function isn't just this call right here. We have to remember to actually come back. Control needs to be retransferred back to this function. So this function returns, this call to factorial returns. We get control back, perform the multiplication, and eventually get our answer. Now, if you look on the course syllabus, you'll see that there's no mention of C or C++ or assembly language or anything like that. And of course, you don't have to know this next few minutes worth of material for the main part of the course, but I do think there's actually some really relevant intuition here. And so I'm going to explain to you what happens in a language C when you compile a recursive call and demonstrate to you how that recursive call executes. All right, so I've got this website here uh, called the Compiler Explorer. It stands at uh, godbolt.org. And you can sort of see what happens when you compile various pieces of code in C and C++ in terms of how they get translated into assembly language. So I've got a compiler here that translates C++ into x86-64 code. That's a 64-bit instruction set that runs on Intel and AMD type processors from the past few decades, basically. Uh, eventually, we're going to probably start switching to ARM. So the new Macs run on ARM. So does you know a ton of other mobile devices all around the world. So the ARM instruction set's a little bit different, um, but I'll focus on teaching maybe the more standard x86 instruction set. So we've got a call to fib right here. Let's just read what the function does. It says if x is equal to 0, or if x is equal to 1, it returns 1. Otherwise, it calls fib on x minus 1, and then calls fib on x minus 2, and then it returns. So the compiler is actually pretty smart. I've turned on optimization. I turned on dash o2, which will do some amount of trying to understand what the code does. So the compiler has been smart enough to recognize that you could replace both of these branches right here with just a comparison to see if this variable EDI, which is going to hold the argument X, that's where the first argument gets passed under the calling convention for this assembly language or this ABI. So it's going to compare X to one, and it's gonna say, assuming that uh, we have the right configurations, we're just gonna move over and return one to return on this architecture you move the number one into something called a register, which is a sort of small set of variables maintained by the processor at runtime, just storing things like local results, it's sort of a small scratch space that gets used very fast and they're baked right into the silicon right next to where all the actual logic processing happens. And then you're gonna execute this return instruction. And return is what actually does the magic. So it transfers program control to a return address located on the top of the stack. So whenever you do a call instruction, the address to return to gets pushed onto the stack. And whenever this return instruction executes, it gets popped off the stack and control is returned to that point, whatever it is. Now there are mechanisms to, for example, make sure that this doesn't get overwritten. There are things like the stack protector and stuff like that, but that's a little bit out of scope of this course for now. So we're saying, if we don't have it uh, be the case that, uh, so if x is greater than uh, one, we're going to go into this branch where we call fib on int, and then we call, um, let's see. I only see one call to fib. So what's happening here? Ah, here's what happens. So then it jumps back to L3 to reuse this call to fib, stores it in a register, performs the right kind of optimization, and then cleans up the stack appropriately. So I'm not gonna explain precisely the, the sort of tricks that it's doing under the hood, but the, the important thing to see is that it's calling fib, it jumps back to itself to do another call to fib, and then eventually it returns. All right, so it makes two separate calls to fib. Both of those push things on the stack. So eventually, if you call fib with something like 20,000, you're going to have this really, really long chain of calls all sitting on the stack. What that means is that you can actually run out of space on the stack. And this is conventionally called a stack overflow. So if you've ever seen this website, stackoverflow.org, where they have these answers to these tech questions, that's where this name comes from. 
All right, so now let's look at what this actually looks like when I run the program. So I've got a uh, Linux machine sitting here. This is actually a machine named uh, ECS Linux. Uh, .syr.edu, and you can actually SSH into it with your student account, but there is a trick. You actually need to use a specific port, uh, which you can ask me what that is on the, uh, on the class Slack, and I'm happy to help you get in. So if you'd like to do this yourself, let me know, and I can help you do it. Uh, I can help you run it and actually do this experiment again. So I've got this piece of code, hello.cpp. All right, so I've got this uh, version of the factorial function. I'm going to call this old fact for a reason that will become apparent in a, in a few more minutes. But this is the traditional direct style recursive implementation of uh, the factorial function. So we say if n is equal to 0, then we return 1. Else we return n times old fact of n minus 1. And we saw that that would get compiled down to some call instructions, which would place some information on the stack to, uh, to actually show some return information. So I think it's kind of best if you can visualize how this actually happens. So let's find out how we might be able to do that. So what I've got set up here is I've got a main function uh, that will accept a single command line argument and it will read it into this variable in right here using the safe scanf function. So it'll read that argument. This is the first command line argument to the program. It'll read that into this variable in using this common C library function that I'm not going to go into here. And then we're going to call old fact on in. All right. So let's compile that. We'll do clang plus plus hello.cpp. Uh, we're going to add debugging information because I'd like to have some listings when I do some debugging. Um, oops, I guess I don't have Clang. Uh, I guess I have G++. All right, so that's the GNU uh, C++ compiler. And I can output it uh, to this file out. And then I can run uh, GDB, which is the GNU debugger, on this binary out. All right, and I can use the command L to uh, list the program for me. All right, so I can L, I can L0 to list the program from the very start. And in particular, what I want to do is I want to put what's called a breakpoint at line 5. And this is because this is the final case where the program bottoms out. Now what I told you a few minutes ago is that there are a bunch of frames that are sitting on the stack. But I think one thing that's really helpful to see as a student is actually observing that that happens for real at the computer's level and in its RAM. All right, so let's see if we can actually observe that behavior. Let's uh, put a breakpoint at line 5. And it says now we've got a breakpoint one at this address here, line five. And I can just run the program. Let's give it a big command line argument, like um, let's say a thousand. All right, and it says I'm at my breakpoint one. And now I can type the command uh, bt for uh, for backtrace. And wow, I've got a whole bunch of stack frames. So I can see. I've got the top of the stack right here, and I can sort of see I've got all these calls lined up right below me, all right? I've got all these different calls lined up, thousands of calls, well, hundreds of calls, all put up on the stack right here, all right? So this is the depth of my stack. All right, so now let's see what happens when I actually uh, go through the stack. So it's not too hard for me to do that. Um, so I can just list the program. I'll set my breakpoint again here at 5. And now let's run the program with, uh, let's say, 20,000. That'll probably be enough to blow up the stack. OK, so it didn't work. I got there. I can continue. What about um, 200,000? Yeah, I guess the stack's probably 8 kilobytes uh, on this size. Okay, it works. Run 2 million. OK, so I got a segmentation fault. So the reason that I got a segmentation fault is actually because I blew past the end of the stack. Segmentation fault is um, 
a depressingly common error in C and C++ type applications. It's just a very generic memory error on Linux to tell you just kind of touch some memory you shouldn't, which in this case is because we uh, ran out of stack space. And so we overwrote a frame that we didn't have access to. So let's talk about how we could actually avoid running out of stack space by using a technique that's called tail recursion. We're now going to define a few really crucial terms in trying to understand tail recursion and tail calls. The first is just that of a tail call. Now, unlike calls in general, a special subset of call sites in Racket, we are going to call tail calls. Now, these tail calls are going to be just like regular function calls, except they don't affect the stack at all. So you'll sort of just jump to them immediately. Tail calls do not grow or shrink the stack. You don't have to do any work or add anything to the stack. So they're kind of more like a jump or a go-to than a normal direct style recursive function call. Now we say that a sub-expression is in tail position if it's the last sub-expression to run whose return value is the also the return value for the parent expression. So let's see what I mean by that. In this example right here, let x be bound to right-hand side, body is in tail position. Body is in tail position because after we're done executing body, we don't have to go back and do any work to finish executing the let. And so because of that, there's no need to keep a stack frame to remember what to execute after we return from body. Now similarly, let's look at if, guard, then, and else. After we finish executing the guard, we don't need to do anything to remember what to do after we return from then and else. We simply return from the entire form. So something is in tail position intuitively if it's the last thing we are going to do in that function. If it's the last thing we're going to do and we would just return immediately, then we don't need to extend the stack at all. We can just use whatever return value we get later. Now we can get to two of the most important definitions. First, we say that a function is tail recursive if every recursive call occurs in tail position. If every recursive call to a recursive function occurs in tail position, then under that circumstance, the recursive call will never extend the stack. And because of that, you'll never have this behavior where you could potentially get a stack overflow. Instead, You'll just simply go to the new invocation and then return whatever that function would have returned. Now it's going to make a lot more sense what a tail recursive function is as we look at a few examples, but I'd like to, you to keep in mind at a very high level, a tail recursive function is one that every recursive call immediately returns. So if you go look at every recursive instance or every call in the function that is recursive and you can say to yourself, aha, I don't have to do anything after this call returns. I would just immediately return. Well, if you can say that, then you can say the function is tail recursive. All right, so now let's dig in and actually write some tail recursive functions and think about why some functions are tail recursive or not. So by the way, we're going to say if a function is not tail recursive, it's going to be using what's called direct style recursion. So direct style recursion is just the sort of normal recursion. If it's using tail recursion, we're going to call the function tail recursive. But if it's just using the more traditional style, we're going to use direct style recursion. So let's start with an example of direct style recursion, the normal factorial function. Let's look at factorial in, just write that one out again. So we're going to say if uh, n is equal to 0, we return 1. Otherwise, we return n times um, factorial of n minus 1. All right, so this is a very standard direct style function. And let's see, why is it not a tail recursive function? All right, so for a function to be tail recursive, so a function is is tail recursive. When every recursive call is a tail call. All right, so let's find every recursive call of factorial. All right, so we've got this call to factorial right here. So we're going to reinvoke ourselves. Now let's say 
Is this a tail call? Well, what does it mean for something to be a tail call? Something is a tail call if it is the last thing you have to do within your function. All right, so for, fact, for this to be a tail call within factorial, I would immediately have to return once I got the answer to this. Now, do I do that? No, I don't. In this case, once I return from factorial, I multiply by n. And for that reason, the computer is going to force me to use the stack. Or not always. There are actually there are some very clever tricks we're going to see in a while. It turns out compilers are extremely good these days. But in general, we're going to use the stack when we use tail uh, when we use direct style recursion. All right. Let's write a version of this function fac tail. We'll see what trick I'm going to play. Here's the key concept. We're going to use an accumulator. This accumulator is going to start at 1. And what I'm going to do, every time I call fact tail, I'm going to increase n, or I'm sorry, I'm going to decrease n, and then I'm going to multiply ack by n until n reaches 0, and then I'm going to return ack. We'll see why this works. So let's say if n is equal to 0, then we're going to return ack. Otherwise, we're going to return fac tail n times, nope, we're going to do n minus 1, and then n times ack. All right. Now first, we should ask ourselves, we're going to see why this works in a second, but let's just ask ourselves, is this a tail recursive function? Well, let's see. Does every recursive call a tail call? So is this a tail call? Well, after this function returns, what do we have to return from? Well, we have to return from the if, but we already said the true or the false branch of an if is already in tail position. So because the false branch of an if is in tail position, this call to fact tail is also in tail position because once we return from fact tail, we can immediately then return from the um, call to fact tail right here. All right, so this is actually a tail call and thus Racket is going to guarantee that it is going to perform what is called tail call optimization where it will not grow the stack. All right, so now let's see how and why does this work? Well, first of all, I have to call fact tail with the right arguments. So if I call fact tail, with 5 and then 1, I get 120. So why is that? Well, it's because fact tail 5, 1, that eventually textually reduces to, we check this right here, we say eventually it's not, we say, okay, well, that's fact tail. And then I get n minus 1, that is 4. And then n times ack, so that's 5 times 1, that's 5. All right, and then we go around again. Four is not equal to zero, so then we go three, and then four times five is 20. And then we go fact tail, two, and then three times 20 is 60. Fact tail, one times two is 120. Fact tail, zero, 120 and then we return 120. So we never grow the stack. It's an extremely fast implementation, at least on the, uh, the old conventional you know, compilation strategy. It's a very fast way to compile it for various reasons. One thing is, if you're not growing the stack, you're actually staying very local within the cache. It's kind of nice. If you're throwing a bunch of stuff on and off the computer stack, you're pulling a bunch of memory in and out of the cache. And so keeping things really tight in the cache and compiling them to loops, it is really advantageous. And so when you can, it is nice to use uh, tail recursive functions, especially if they're going to be in sort of tight loops or over large lists or something like that. But in general, I would say, don't worry about it too much. Racket won't let you run out of the stack. It'll start to reallocate whenever you would run out. So it's not a big deal, but it is important for us to learn 
how to write tail recursive functions because it's going to help us practice how we can understand how to transform some of these functions to use these various different accumulation based styles, which will become important very later on in the course when we talk about how compilers and interpreters are implemented that uses these kind of techniques. Now, I'll also say, often when we have tail recursive functions, they're going to need to have these extra accumulator arguments that we're going to use to track things like state and things like that. So it's often going to be really helpful to actually hide these behind what are called helper functions. So I can write h in ack, and then I'll just make this call to fact tail, actually a call to h. All right. And then I've cleanly separated this interface here. So now I have h in, I always want to make one, the starting argument for this to work out. And now let's ask ourselves again, h is tail recursive, fact tail uses h, all fact tail does is immediately call h. All right, so fact tail itself, it's not recursive, it's just using this tail recursive function right here. All right. So that's a trick that you might often play when you transform things to use tail recursion. All right, so let's think about how we might make this Fibonacci function tail recursive now. So it's actually a pretty tricky exercise. Um, the key point is to realize that you can actually use memoization to do it. Memoization is this term or that might... All right, so how could we write the Fibonacci function without using uh, direct style recursion? If we wanted to use tail recursion, how could we do it? Well, it's pretty tricky. We would have to make this call to fib here be the last thing that happened. But unfortunately, we have to go and compute this other call to fib. So the trick is to realize that we can use a trick called dynamic programming. So in dynamic programming, what you do is you track a finite number of cells or some set of cells or memory that builds up parts of your result. And then you gradually build up a table of that memory. In the case of Fibonacci, we can exploit this insight where we only have to remember, let's say we want the int Fibonacci number. All we have to remember is the last two values to generate the next value. So here's how we start. We write down the first two numbers of the sequence one and one, and then we take, uh, so this is going to be our, let's say, our nth element of the sequence, and this is going to be our n plus oneth element of the sequence. So to initialize, we're going to, uh, the initial run is going to be that uh, we're looking for the nth Fibonacci number, it's gonna start with zero. So to get the first Fibonacci number, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the n plus oneth Fibonacci number we're going to swap that into the nth place. And then to get the n plus the next n plus one Fibonacci number, we're going to sum the last two. So this is going to be one plus one, that'll be two. All right, what about two? Now we want to slide two over into this position, two. And then uh, we get three. And then three, we do the same thing, slide the three over into this position. And then two plus three is five we can keep going. All right, so this gives us an immense hint about how we could do this. Let's say that you wanted the third Fibonacci number. What would you do? Well, you could write a function that accepts three arguments. It accepts n, which is the nth Fibonacci number, the number you want to get, and then it tracks, using variables in its arguments, two values an nth and an n plus oneth argument. So here's how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna define fib helper to be n, and then nth, and then n plus oneth. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if n is equal to zero, Then I'm going to return the nth Fibonacci number. Otherwise, I'm going to call fib helper. Now I'm going to say n minus 1. And then uh, I'm going to do n plus 1th and nth. So then I'm going to do n plus 1th and then plus nth, n plus 1th. 
So let's see how this actually works. So now if I run something like five and then I do one and one, I get eight, fib helper, let's say I do six, and then I have to start with these two initial seed values always being one and one for me to get the actual Fibonacci sequence. All right, so I could wrap up this call to fib helper by doing a define of fib uh, and then in, and I can say this is just fib helper in one and one, and that'll get me the right behavior. Now I'd like to end this lecture by discussing what happens when you use tail recursion in a language like C and C++. It turns out that their compilers will actually exploit tail recursion to eliminate call instructions as well. And this is a crucial optimization in C and C++ applications, specifically for not trashing the iCache. So let's look at how this tail recursive version of the fib function is compiled. It's pretty much the same as before, except if we look at the compi uh, compilation output over here, we'll see there aren't any instances of a call instruction. There's a single return. This function returns once. What the compiler has done, I'm using dash O2 to turn on the, uh, the sort of two out of three optimization option. If I turn on dash O2, the compiler will turn this tail recursive call in tier into a really tight loop. And this is excellent for performance, especially on modern architectures where all of this code will be kept very close to each other in the instruction cache. So you'll be able to jump right around the iCache. You won't have to load any code into memory into the cache. So that'll make this code extremely efficient. And there are real sincere reasons you would really want to use tail recursion, even in a uh, language like C and C++, if you wanted to get the best possible performance you could out of recursive code. All right, so that's going to wrap up lecture today. Uh, we'll have another lecture on how to use tail recursion to re-implement some of the kind of direct style recursive functions we've seen so far in class. Thank you.